Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to See the Futures. My name is Jim Cagnino with Ninja Trader. Today's May 31st, 2028. I got that date right? Close enough. Thanks for being here. We got a lot of stuff to talk about. Very special guests. Before we go too far, let, me, let me remind everybody, trading futures, options on futures involves substantial risk of loss. Not suitable for all traders and investors. Oftentimes in futures trading, you have a high combination of leverage and volatility, and although that could be an equation for opportunity, it's also an equation for risk. So be careful, only fund your future trading account with risk capital. My personal definition, money I could afford to lose doesn't change my lifestyle, lengthen my retirement horizon, or overly stress me out. As human beings, we make bad decisions when we're under stress. So be in a good spot. Remember, micro futures could be friends. Easy on the day trade margins, usually not best practices to max out on those day trade margins on a regular basis. And having said all that, I got to introduce our special guest today on See the Futures. Uh, Eric Norland is with us. Eric is the executive director, senior economist at CME Group. And interestingly enough, has a master's in statistics from Columbia University and is a CFA. And you might be the first fellow that I've met with a master's in statistics. Good afternoon, Eric. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. And so you, now you're in uh, the UK right now, right? Yeah, I moved. I I moved to the UK. Um, when was it? Six years ago. Six years ago in May two thousand seventeen. From New wow. York City. So are you in? Then you're in London proper, right? Yeah, I'm in London proper, and I actually have dual U.S. and French citizenship. So prior to moving here, I'd done about half my career in New York and half my career in Paris. So it's um yeah, I kind of I kind of see the perspective of both sides of the Atlantic, if you will. So you speak three languages then, right? You speak English, French, and British. <laughs> That's right. Yes. I, yeah. The thing is, I, I, I don't ever really try to speak with a British accent because, you know, the problem here is that there are, I, I would say, roughly 65 different British accents. Um, and so it's very hard to know which one to speak with if you attempt to do it. Wow. Well, of course, you know, Great Britain is a big, big place with different, different, different countries there. And we can talk about that in a little bit of detail uh, as we go forward. Well, I'm glad we're here and I'm glad we have that European perspective because, you know, we have a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of moving parts today, including the German CPI, which we, uh, hopefully we could talk about. Uh, but before we get to that, I was um, I, I did want to talk about the Fed and what's going on over here. You know, it was a weird morning where Jolts came out. The CME Group's Fed funds tools, you know, just literally rallied 18 uh, percent to a 25 basis point hike at the next meeting. And I was shocked by that. Just that one economic release did that. It seemed maybe not. Yeah, you know, I looked at the tool yesterday. And so yesterday it was saying that we had, um, I think, around a 60 percent chance that the Fed raised rates at the next meeting. Um, now it's showing maybe around a 70 percent chance. So it definitely moved the needle a little bit. Uh, but for some reason, the market has begun to price in this additional rate hike that I think almost nobody was expecting just a few weeks ago. Um, so there must be actually kind of a lot of economic data that's sort of contributing to this view. Uh, maybe the persistence of core inflation uh, is among among the things that are concerning people. Um, but it's interesting. Because there was nothing really in the Fed's rhetoric that gave me a clear sense that they were definitely going to raise rates or even really seriously thinking about raising rates on June 14th. And yet that is what the market is pricing that more likely than not, they're going to do. And it's a big change in expectations from a few weeks ago when the market was saying maybe a 10% chance and the most likely outcome would be that they actually start cutting rates as soon as September. Yeah. So, and so me and my partner, Tom Schneider, we've been tracking like the different FOMC members, uh, you know, hawkish dovish comments it almost seems like it's a 50 50 at this point does that make chair powell's job a little harder to get a consensus the way he wants it to go yeah and if he doesn't have a consensus i think there's maybe a strong argument for the fed just standing pat i mean they raised rates already 500 basis points it's already the biggest rate tightening cycle since 1981 um, it's even surpassed um, the size of the tightening cycle from 2004 to 2006 uh, which came 
you know, on the eve of the global financial crisis. And I think the Fed is also, at least, at least the more experienced members are aware that there are sometimes substantial lags between when the Fed moves policy and when the economy responds. Uh, if you look at the tightening cycles that completed in 89 um, and uh, 2000 and 2006, uh, those were followed by recessions that it began 10 to 17 months after the last rate hike. Um, you know, so it can take a long time for the economy to decelerate um, in the face of rate hikes. And so I think that the Fed you know, might be wise to not go too much further before they've collected a little bit more data uh, about how the economy is going to respond to all of this. That makes sense. And that was a great piece you wrote on the CME website about that lag effect that we saw. Um, and I meant to ask you after I read that also, you know, we track, you, we, we're looking at the yield curve. And we're talking about inversion. And I usually use the two and 10 year micro uh, micro contracts to look at that. What's a better way to kind of look at that uh, yield curve inversion? You know, I look at it in a bunch of different ways. I don't think that there's necessarily a right way or a wrong way. Twos, tens is a fine way to look at it. Um, you know, in my modeling, I tend to find that the um, the best forecaster is usually three months versus 30 years. Uh, so like a three-month T-bill versus a 30-year bond yield or three-month SOFR uh, versus like the 30-year swap rate. Um, it seems like the private sector yield curves actually work better in economic forecasting than the public sector curve. Um, you know, I, I love our futures. Our futures are all based on government bonds. I mean, government bonds are interesting and important, but there's only one entity on the planet that borrows at the government's rates, and that's the federal government. Everybody else is borrowing at private sector rates. Um, and it's really the private sector more so than the public sector that's driving the economic cycle. Uh, so the difference between, say, three months so far and like a 30 year swap rate, um, you know, may or a 10 year swap rate may actually be the most accurate indicator of where the economy is going. So when I look at a three, but when I look at a three month T bill now, in light of this debt ceiling drama that's going on, we we see that it's extraordinarily high the yield on the three months with the expectation, hey, maybe there's going to be a technical fall. Yeah, and you know what? But that's real, though. I mean, you know, if, if when you see these kinds of premiums being built into both public and private sector rates, um, you know, that's a sign that credit has become extremely expensive in the short term. And you know, the problem, the reason why I think the yield curve is important from a sort of fundamental economic perspective, is that the banking system makes money by borrowing from depositors short term and lending long term. So when the yield curve is steep. That means that the banking sector is making really fat profit margins, and they'll be more willing to extend credit to people and to take risks in extending those loans. Uh, when the yield curve inverts, for whatever reason, it's because of central bank tightening or some other reason like fear of default, um, you know, banks get much, much smaller profit margins or even maybe negative profit margins, and eventually they just stop lending. Um, and so that's when the economy really begins to decelerate, defaults start picking up, and economic activity starts turning downwards. So from a bank's lending point of view, how big a deal is, you know, mortgage rates? I mean, MBA Mortgage Association came out this morning with 6.9% average conventional loan rate, which is extraordinarily high in recent memory. Yeah. So, I mean, I think from the banking perspective, this is interesting. Um you know, two years ago, when mortgage rates were at their low, they were at 3%. So they've gone from basically 3% to 7%. They've more than doubled. Um, and so you're starting to see the impact on housing prices. If you look at the Case-Shiller Index, which came out, I think, just yesterday, uh, it was showing now a year-on-year -year decline in prices, not very big decline, like a 1% decline in price. Um, but you know what? I think this is, in some ways, very different than 2006. You know, going into 2000. Uh, seven and 2008, the global financial crisis. Um, at that time, vacancy rates in housing were extremely high. Something like 10% of houses weren't even occupied. You know, at the peak of that building period in the, like the 2005, six, and seven. Um, and you know, there was a lot of rental vacancy rates back then too. So housing demand was really weak. Um, this time, it's kind of the opposite. You have record low. Um, at least since they began keeping statistics in 1965, we have record low 
uh, vacancy rates for both owner-occupied housing as well as for rental housing. Uh, so I don't think it's really the housing market's a big issue. What really worries me here is the commercial property market. Um, yeah, that residential real estate in the U.S. has a total value of, I think, around $47 trillion. Um, commercial property has a total value of around $21 trillion, so it's not as big, but it's still very, very large. Um, and so it's not just the mortgages on houses that have gone up, but also the uh, cost of borrowing for all these commercial property developments, whether there's shopping malls, strip malls, offices, et cetera. And people just don't need these things like they used to, you know, where a lot of us are working from home and, you know, a lot of people do online shopping still. So like the idea of the shopping mall, the strip mall, the office, it just doesn't have the cachet it used to. And now the financing cost has suddenly more than doubled. Yeah, I mean, from COVID to Amazon.com, I, I don't like to leave my house anymore. <laughs> it's easy to work here, easy to live here. Yeah. Um, well, let's pivot. Let's pivot over. Let's pivot over now to the to your side of the pond, so to speak. The ECB. Um, you know, this morning I think there was a little bit of a surprise on the German uh, CPI uh, numbers. Good, a good surprise for Germans, right? Yeah, yeah. So the German CPI came in quite far below expectations. Um, and it's not just, well, on the other hand, you know, in the, Christine Lagarde has this task because she has to manage monetary policy for the entire Eurozone. So Germany is the largest and, you know, most important component of the Eurozone. On the other hand, yeah, you know, like Italian inflation, for example, declined, but it surprised significantly above consensus. Uh, we got a Spanish number out yesterday and I think a French number out. Um, the picture overall is favorable as so far as headline inflation goes. Um, but everybody kind of knew that because, you know, natural gas prices, which started to soar here in Europe uh, in late 2021, um, have been plummeting. So people's electrical costs are coming way back down. Um, this is sort of an ongoing process that will play out over many more months. And of course, we've also seen a big drop off in crude oil prices as well. Um, so the headline numbers are going to be a lot better. Um, that's great. Um, what I think is missing in the German number, but was present in the Spanish number, for example, was a core inflation. And core inflation in Europe, as well as most other countries, has been much more persistent. Uh, so tomorrow, we're going to get out the Eurozone CPI, uh, both the headline number, and they will also release a core ex food and energy number. Um, and so the expectation on that one is it's still going to be around 5.4, 5.5% year on year, which is not very much different than the most recent reading of 5.6%. Um, and so I think that that's really what's keeping Christine Lagarde up at night. Uh, she knows energy prices are dropping and she knows that's good news. Uh, but the ECB has to think about why its policy rate is at 3.75% when core inflation likely is somewhere around 5.5%. That means that she still has negative 1.75% real rates. Um, you compare that to the U.S., it's very different. You know, the Fed has its rates now over 5%. Core inflation in the U.S. is also 5.5%. So these two things are much more closely aligned. Um, so it kind of fed this expectation that the ECV probably has a lot further to go uh, in terms of raising rates over the course of the summer, uh, despite more benign headline numbers coming out of Germany and likely the Eurozone as a whole. So the, when I look at the when I look at the futures currency pair, the euro FX versus the U.S. dollar uh, at CME, it, it looks like the euro the euro is back in kind of a bearish state right now. And is that is it is that a directly because of the inf interest rate differential? Um, yeah, it may be that may be one of the roles, uh, maybe one of the things that that that's impacting it. Usually, interest rate differentials, I would say. Are, are one of uh, kind of four major drivers of currencies, um, along with relative growth rates. Uh, we've seen a lot of softening in Europe's growth rate recently that we haven't really seen so much in the U.S. data. Um, that may also be playing a role. And the other two things are the relative trade deficit, which I don't think is playing much of a role at the moment. Uh, they're kind of you know, not really changing much given their, from their historical patterns. And then the relative size of budget deficits is, can also play a role. And I don't think that's also a major driver. So I attribute this to interest rate differentials and to the pace of growth. And, and does that, is that pay, you know, we're hearing some discussion about, well, the pace of growth is, going, is really going to also be affected by China and their lack of progress on their economy. Is that, is that, is that a factor that's been talked about? 
Well, I think that China is the single biggest driver of most commodity prices, certainly when it comes to oil, oil, um, agricultural goods, prices, especially crops like corn, wheats and, and soybean oil. Um, and then also when it comes to industrial metals like copper and aluminum, China is really the major driver. Um, and you're right. So China's economy is in a sort of strange state where it has roughly three different things going on. On the one hand, consumer spending is decent in China. It's rising at about 7% year on year. So Chinese consumers are out there. They're spending again. The Chinese services sector is doing well. Um, but this is very small portion of China's economy. You know, in our economy's consumer spending is like 60 or 70% of GDP. In China, it's like 35 or 40%. Uh, what's not doing so well in China is manufacturing, which is starting to contract again, which is a very worrying and unnerving sign, I think, especially for commodities like oil and industrial metals. Um, and then lastly, you have the housing sector where housing construction is falling at something like 20 percent year on year um, as a sort of property bubble continues to deflate. Um, so the overall picture of China's economy, I think, is very disappointing for anybody who was expecting that they would have this huge pop in growth um, as a result of lifting the COVID restrictions. There's some pop in consumer spending and services, but nothing beyond that. Interesting. So let me ask you, though, so back to Christine Lagarde. So their monetary policy group works a little bit differently than the FOMC, but kind of similar, right? There's there's more members associated with the votes, right? Yeah, there's says like one from each country. So 2020, I would guess. I mean, I don't know that they all necessarily get to vote all the time, but yeah, it's uh, it's definitely very it's different. I mean, it's the Fed is also kind of odd in its organization too. Like some of the Fed districts, like Philadelphia Fed is like teeny tiny, and the New York Fed's teeny tiny in terms of its geographic area, and the San Francisco Fed covers like this vast area in the entire western part of the country. Um, it kind of reflects how the Fed was put together back in 1913 um, and a sort of population demographics and relative importance of areas of the economy that existed at the time. But the ECB has something kind of similar. It's sort of organized more like the U.S. Senate, you know, where every Senate, every state gets two votes irrespective of its size, right? Um, so, you know, like Germany gets a vote, France gets a vote, Luxembourg gets a vote. It's kind of, you know, it's very different in its organizational form. Yeah, and those aren't those aren't regions or districts. Those are sovereign countries, which are you know distinct uh, culturally, among other things, right? Yeah, and have different economic needs. I mean, you've, you have kind of a Northern European versus Southern European divide at times, uh, very different levels of debt. I mean, like Germany, for example, has very low levels of public and private sector debt. Uh, France has extremely high levels of public and private sector debt. Um, and, you know, so you have different uh, you know, sort of sensitivities to interest rate movements as a result of that. Um, and you also have different cultural pro proclivities, like the Germans uh, have been haunted for the last century by the hyperinflation, uh, which hit its peak 100 years ago in 1923. Um, there were other countries, you know, may prefer a slightly higher inflation rate because it helps them to actually manage their debt more easily. Yeah, and that's got to make her job a lot, uh, in my opinion, probably a lot harder than Jerry Paul's job. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the uh, <laughs> the joke about the ECB has been that, you know, during the first 10 years, they had the Deutschmark. During the second 10 years, they had the French franc. And eventually, they might wind up with the Italian lira. So, I mean, you don't really know exactly, like, where where this is going to go in the long term. Um, but, yeah, it's... Uh, it's, it's difficult. And you, you refer to these countries as sovereign countries, which in many ways they are. They all still have their sovereignty, but they are also under the EU state, a sort of, you know, supranational organization of the EU. And they're all issuing debt into a common currency, uh, which makes the European bond market a lot more like a municipal bond market in the U.S. than the U.S. Treasury market, where you have the U.S. government as a sole issuer of treasuries. Into, into a market with a single central bank. Um, you can really question whether or not, uh, you could say the European countries are sovereign, but you can question whether or not it actually is a sovereign bond market. Interesting. And so where's the ECB in terms of uh, quantitative tightening? Now, the ECB has begun to shrink its balance sheet. 
um, a little bit. Uh, it's not as active in this as the Fed, but it is starting to shrink its balance sheet. It will probably accelerate that shrinkage at some point in the future. Uh, but they also face a problem that the Fed does not. You know, when the Fed shrinks its balance sheet, I guess its hope, I suppose, is that it will you know, kind of steepen the yield curve by lessening the demand for longer term bonds. Um, as it just sort of stops buying them and allows the existing ones to roll gradually into maturity. Um, the ECB has another issue, yeah, which is that the Eurozone nearly blew itself up uh, between 2009 and 2012 when there was a tremendous widening of spreads between the different countries. Um, you know, before 2009, um, compared to Germany, the other bonds typically traded within a narrow band of maybe 20 or 30, 35 basis points over Germany. Um, by 2011 and 2012, countries like Italy and Spain were seeing their bonds trading at five, six, seven hundred basis points over Germany, not to even mention Greece, which essentially defaulted on its debt and had to have its uh, the maturity of its bonds lengthened. So like five year bonds became 15 year bonds, et cetera. Um, and so she has the issue of having to be careful about not blowing up the eurozone again. Uh, you know, Mario Draghi, when he her predecessor, when he came in in 2012, he said he would do whatever it takes to keep the eurozone together. And that involved cutting rates to negative and printing huge amounts of money to buy these bonds, which eventually collapsed their spreads. Uh, but he was able to do that for one reason which is that inflation in the euro area for many years was below target at around 1%. They were meant to achieve 2%. So he could feel comfortable printing all this money and narrowing these bond spreads without any consequence of inflation. Uh, but now that inflation's higher, she's in a much more difficult situation. So she has to figure out some way to reduce the balance sheet, reduce inflation, raise rates, but without somehow blowing up the euro area again, as it almost did back in 2011 and 2012. It, so our his it, you know post Brexit now let's pivot to the Bank of England they have their own they have their own you know process right very parliamentary I love everything about uh, the way England does stuff but um, where are they at on this whole on the cycle with inflation and interest rates so in the UK our inflation rate is substantially worse than it is in either Europe or in the US. Uh, we got our headline inflation rates up to around 11% at the peak. It's now down to a mere 8.7%. Uh, if you look at the core inflation rate, um, it's significantly worsened than when we got the uh, the most recent numbers. It went from 6.2%, which was already about seven tenths of a percent worse in the U.S. or the euro area, to 6.8%. So another more than a full point above us in terms of inflation. Um, and when this most recent number came out, it really jolted expectations for the Bank of England. And the Bank of England, I think, has been in a profound denial of reality. Uh, when you go back just two months ago, Andrew Bailey, uh, the head of the Bank of England, was saying, well, we think we're almost done raising rates. This is when they had rates at 4%. Since then, they've already raised rates to 4.5%. Inflation has continued to soar at the core level. And now... The Sonia futures market basically says that, you know, that they're going to have to move rates up to five and a half percent. So they probably have at least another 75 or 100 basis points to go over the course of the summer. Um, and you know, their policy rate currently is 2.3 percent below inflation. Um, so they're still going to sense subsidizing people to borrow money. Um, and you know, I think that Brexit is a part of this. You know, Brexit created a lot of trade friction that was not present previously, and that trade friction is very inflationary. Um, so it's adding a lot of uh, expenses to companies as they do business across the channel. So, and we're seeing the British pound, it's faring better versus the U.S. dollar than the euro is, as an example, because of this. Yeah, and I think the I think that may be because, uh, well, first of all, the pound you really crashed with the Brexit referendum in 2016. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it had been at one and a half versus a dollar, and then it dropped down to around 120. Um, so that was all very inflationary. But now that it has all this inflation, it's putting a lot more upward pressure on rates. Uh, so we saw a huge, huge rise in gilt yields um, this month. 
Uh, for example, yields in the U.S. and in the euro area fell, uh, well, I say in the euro area fell around 20 basis points this month. In the U.K., they rose around 40 basis points at the 10-year point in the curve. Um, so this expectation of higher rates is starting to draw capital into the British pound and starting to support the pound, which in some ways is good news because a stronger currency is one of a number of factors that can help contain inflation. Yeah, interesting. So you, you open the door a little bit for this question, so I'm going to ask it. We and Here in the U.S., you have all of these FOMC people, people running around giving speeches and saying things seemingly on a random basis. Does, uh, does uh, Andrew Bailey have the same issue with their nine members over there? Um, yeah, I think at times, yeah. I think I don't know if it's as pronounced, but um, I think that they have kind of different issues over here. So, you know, in here in England, there's the Monetary Policy Committee, but there's also a Financial Risk Committee. Um, and so last fall, uh, when the gilt market started to collapse as a result of this sort of fiscally irresponsible budget that the uh, seven weeks Prime Minister Liz Truss cooked up, um, what happened is the Bank of England was in the midst of a tightening cycle and the bond market collapsed. You know, yields went from 3% to 5% and looked like they were going to continue to soar. Um, so the Bank of England's risk committee intervened in the market and bought 75 billion pounds worth of gilt. So they basically started doing QE and they informed the monetary policy committee of their decision. Uh, so it was kind of like, hey, we're doing monetary policy from a risk perspective. And by the way, you'll have to deal with this later on from an inflation perspective. And so now we're kind of seeing some of the results, I think, of that you know, monetary easing in the midst of a tightening cycle uh, with this sort of very high level of inflation here and the need for the MPC now to hike rates further. So it's, you know, all of these central banks kind of have their own issue. But when it comes right down to it, they're all faced with a fundamental choice that's very uncomfortable, which is they're going to have to choose between continuing to fight inflation and financial stability. So is there is there a does the PM try to influence the Bank of England as much as possible or no? I don't think so. No, I think that, um, you know, one of Tony Blair's first things he did when he came to office in 1997 uh, was to sort of grant the Bank of England its independence. Um, so I don't really think that the Bank of England is influenced by the PM, and I don't think the PM or, or the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, uh, are trying to influence the Bank of England's decisions. Uh, I think what's going on is, is something a little different. It's more that when something happens on the fiscal side that causes significant distress in the bond market, the central bank feels obliged to come in and intervene in the name of financial stability. It's not that they're under pressure to do so from politicians. It's they're under pressure to do so from the banking system um, and, you know, and just from the, the sense of trying to hold the financial system together. Yeah, that that totally that totally makes sense. How's the new PM? How, how, how do you say his name? Rizzi? I'm going to say it wrong. Yeah, Rishi, Rishi Sunak. Yeah. 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 So Rishi Sunak is, I think, a really brilliant individual. And I think he's actually quite personally popular here in the UK. Um, however, I think that, you know, he's sort of weighed down by his political party, which is, uh, you know, has um, a lot of baggage. Um, you know, the Brexit, which was sort of championed by the Conservative Party, has become very, very unpopular. It's only about 20 percent of the population who still feel that Brexit was a good idea, uh, or about 55% or 58% of the population think it was a bad idea. Um, a significant majority of people also want the next government or the current government to move closer to the European Union. Um, and when you look at the Tory party's demographics, um, you know, it's kind of about 15 points behind labor in the overall polling uh, of the population. When you look at people under 50 years old, it's running around 45 or 50 percent behind labor. There's only one group where it leads, and that's 65 and up, which is not the healthiest demographic on which to build your future. That's almost that's almost my age. I'm getting there. <laughs> well, look, I'm 49, so you know I'll be I'll be to the the 50 plus demographic next year. It's funny, like the 50 to 65s are kind of in between. They they're not as conservative as their elders and are not as left-leaning as the younger than 50 population.
Yeah, yeah, I, I hear you. So let me ask you one more question. We're almost up against time here. Um, does the, what kind of, does what kind of influence does the Bank of England have over you know the rest of the UK? You know, Ireland, Scotland, you know, Wales, the, these kind of places. Well, so the Bank of England is the is essentially the the bank for these other countries as well. Okay. Um, now, it's funny, when you travel up to Scotland, you will see Bank of Scotland notes. So there is a Bank of Scotland that is part of the Bank of England system. Um, you know, sort of like there is a Federal Reserve of San Francisco, but it doesn't have different looking currency. Uh, but if you go to Scotland, you will see pound notes that say like Bank of Scotland on them. Um, sort of like in the euro area, when you get the coins, like the one, two euro coins on the back of them, will have the different national symbols, like the French olive tree or the German eagle or you know, et cetera, uh, the Spanish or, D or Dutch, you know, kings or whatever, but it's all one bank. You know, it's like in uh, in the euro area, like the Banque de France and the Bundesbank are all part of the bank, European Central Bank system. I, I got it. That makes a lot of sense. Um, we are up against time, Eric. I really appreciate you taking time. It's it's even, it's almost pub time for you, right? It's it's evening, right? Yeah, it's it's five thirty. So, you know, I I missed high tea because of all of these meetings. But you know, I'll have to uh, have to have some scones with Devonshire cream a bit late or something. I don't know. Uh, that sounds sounds great. Well, again, I really appreciate taking the time to be here. Uh, I know we're on the schedule again, coming up in in a couple of months or so. And um, again, thank you so much for being here. All right, thank you. And everybody, you could find you could find you could find Eric's work at cmegroup.com. He publishes a whole bunch of, of great stuff. Uh, also follow him um, on Twitter and other places. Having said all that, appreciate everybody being here today with us. Most important message of the day, please be safe out there. Be good to each other. Thanks again.